All right. Good evening. Welcome to Dessa Deconstructed from the local show on 89.3 The Current. My name is David Campbell. Thanks, Jim. Uh, so today, we're, I'm super excited to have you guys here because today is the day before Dessa's third album, Parts of Speech, is released. Now, for an artist, I think the day before the record drops is probably a pretty big deal. Uh, I imagine that it's like the night before a birthday for a five-year-old. <laughs> the excitement, the anticipation, and then there's the gut-wrenching anxiety. Um, you know, like you've been planning your own birthday party for the better part of a year or two, and you're probably pretty worried that some of the people you want to show up might not come because they're going to another party, a different party, like the Mavis Staples party. She's pretty cool, right? You know, they have a lot of the same friends. Or the India Ire party. Uh, that lady's awesome. She sold like three million records. Or what if they all go to the Brett Michaels jamming with friends party? I don't think I could even ha show my face at school if that happened. It would be the worst. <laughs> so I've done some projecting somewhere in there. Uh, I have a very active imagination. I think most of us do. It's one of the great human characteristics and has allowed for all sorts of wonderful inventions and ideas, but it has also the fountain for flights of fancy and delusion. We make up our own truths, which may be far from reality. Today, we're gonna get the truth. We'll be challenging our own constructions and perceptions around why an artist is the way an artist is. Why do they do things the way that they do? We're gonna go straight to the source. Dessa Deconstructed is an opportunity for us to get an inside look at the artistic process behind creating Dessa's new album, Parts of Speech, both tough and tender Parts of Speech is a journey into some uncharted territories, both creatively and sonically. Today we're going to take a look under the hood at six of the 12 songs on the record and find out why they had to be sung and how they came to life. We'll see bits and pieces of them in the rawest form, sometimes going from the initial idea to recording the pieces for the album version to hearing the finished track and then watching how the band brings the recorded version to life as they perform it for you here today. It's going to be fun, I promise you. Are you up for some fun? Are you ready to learn? Okay, this sounds better if I do it in robot voice. Are you ready for the deconstruction? <laughs> All right, let's get acquainted. Uh, Dessa's band first, Sean McPherson on the bass today. And drummer Joey Van Phillips. Handling guitar and uh, some vocals and some keys, Dustin Kyle. Also doing a little bit of keyboard work and uh, singing those lovely harmonies you're gonna hear all night long, Miss Abby Wolf. A little bit later on, Doomtree producer Laserbeak will be here. He's standing, right. come on, come on out, man. Come on out, give him a round of applause. And last, but certainly not least, the guest of honor, ladies and gentlemen, Dessa. <laughs> Happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody showed up. Everybody the, showed up. Right. So um, to start with, we're going to play a little game. You guys up for a game? OK. Now, most of the music that you listen to is the sum total of a great many parts, some of which your ears hear and your brain identifies. That is, you could sing along to that part uh, and you know, maybe the song as it replays in your car. Other parts, which create the richness and the depth of the track, your ear may hear, but you probably don't consciously identify the sound as a part of the song. Dessa's gonna play some stems. What are stems again? So, to create any given hip hop beat. Usually you have like a lot of sounds all running at the same time. And uh, stems are usually like groups of just kind of isolated noises that layer to create the full beat. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> yes, they are. That's good learning. <laughs> well done. <laughs> you came to learn. I appreciate that. Uh. So what we're going to do is as she plays these stems, we're going to do them one at a time. And we're going to see how quickly you can identify what the song is. If you know the answer, raise your hand. But don't shout it out, OK? Because we're all going to yell it out together at the end of the third stem in case we're all wrong. And then we won't <laughs> feel so dumb. So we'll be dumb together. It'll be good. So uh, what do you say? First stem? Let's do it. Uh, uh, Any hands? 
hands. I don't see any hands in the audience. I thought you had your hand up, but you were just putting your glasses on to get serious about learning. <laughs> That's cool. Second stem? Let's do the second one. All right, I see one. Do we have one? Or were you just waving to somebody? No? Anyone, anyone got their hand? Oh, we got one over here. OK, so one, two, two people. Three, four. Okay, we got a few. All right, should we do the third one? Yeah. All right. All right, so in total, hands high if you think you know what song it is. Should we do it? Let's On three, you ready? One, two, three. You got it. Well done, well done. Okay, now the reveal. So this is how, like, that first stem is Paper Tiger in his apartment going, ah, ah, ah. He wasn't feeling good that day. <laughs> I, think, I think it was paper, paper feeling great, man. <laughs> will you? <laughs> or, yeah, right. He's killing, he's making a great beat. Will you, will you play them all together? You got it now? Yeah. All right, cool. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Warsaw, actually. That's kind of a different style for you. You know, when um, maybe a little more clubby, a little more mm. Ryan Olsen, a little more marijuana <laughs> death squads. I, when I heard it, I, I thought I was, I was excited, I was curious, but I was just like, whoa. Yeah, I think I, mean, I first heard that beat um, on like a, a big collection uh, that Paper Tiger had put together. I think I had written Laserbeak and Paper Tiger and just said, hey, I'm trying to finish this record. Do you guys have any open beats? You know, s beats that people haven't already kind of put dibs on. Mm -hmm. And that was in a batch of like a dozen. And I thought, oh man, this does not sound like anything I would ever do. But I found myself rewinding it a lot, you know? And I thought, oh man, I could just see like Sims's face like, really? <laughs> uh, I like the V a lot, but it felt like it would be a statement to rap on it, which kind of tweaked me out. That was the part that was probably really appealing to you in some way. I, yeah, sort of, but also, I mean, I roll with a lot of really, you know, I roll with like some rappers, rappers, man. You know, Mike McLon is like one of my favorite pattern writers ever. So, you know, uh, exciting, but also a little, a little nervous thing. So what made you in the end decide, you know, to really go for it? I think I'd been rewinding it a lot. And then I finally found kind of like a, a galloping cadence that felt like it would work over it. So I had the like percussive pattern of the lyric in my head, even though I didn't have any words. So I just kind of recorded that, f you know, mumbling and then stuck real syllables in afterwards. When it was all said and done, um, you know, how do you feel about it? Is this an outfit that you'll continue to wear or is it one that uh. you're thinking like, I can't believe I bought this? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know what's funny? Is that right now? Hold on. I know that for the radio audience, you can't see, but there's a tag on my jeans because I don't think I'm going to wear... I'm taking these back. These didn't... <laughs> <laughs> these are too tight. <laughs> I, I love it. I love that beat. I'm really proud of that song. And um, yeah, paper, if you're listening, man, send me an email with some more beats. So. Ask for a joke and the universe provides. <laughs> This is Dessa Deconstructed from the local show on 89.3 The Current. We're taking a look inside uh, Dessa's creative process and at her new album, Parts of Speech. Uh, do you mind if we talk for just a little bit about how you write your lyrics? Mm -mm. Specifically, no, that's good, because I don't know what <laughs> I would have done. Really no, I don't want to do that. I was like, I I'm not into that. Yeah. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask um, about the, the second single, which we've been playing for couple weeks now, maybe two weeks, is that right? Something like that? Um, it's called Call Off Your Ghost, and I wanted to know if that is a 100% autobiographical piece. Yeah, I think most of the lyrics on any record that I've written that could be true are true. You know, so if I'm talking about like a, a talking crow, well, that obviously was made up. <laughs> but for most of the like believable human circumstances, that's what that those are true. So in this in that song, the lyrics talk about going to a the wedding of an old friend, knowing that a an ex boyfriend would be there, and kind of bracing for it. 
And um, I wrote that at the wedding of an old friend. <laughs> After having seen an ex, I, I excused myself and went to the car and, and wrote those lyrics on a scrap of paper. That's how it happens. Do you ever have to embellish the story to make it stronger or, mm -hmm. you know, that or change things to protect the privacy of the people who are, you know, your friends and acquaintances who are in the story? Yeah, I think with some exceptions and with some meaningful mistakes, um, I think usually I, I do ask the person who it's about, like, am I putting you out there too hard? If I think that it's a song in which that person will easily recognize themselves, you know, so if if I write a song wherein the second person, the you, will think, uh, <laughs> that's quite obviously me, <laughs> um, then, I'll, then I'll send a note just to make sure that, like, I, I don't feel like I have license to violate their privacy. What I want to do with my privacy, you know, that's, that's my decision about right. how open I want to be, but I don't want to be exhibitionistic at the expense of someone else's life. Have you ever changed uh, what you've written based on feedback you've gotten from somebody who was the subject of one of your stories? And, well, let me, yeah, have you ever changed it? There's one song I wish I had. Yeah, like, I, I thought I had changed the details enough that I was really being respectful. Um, but I don't think I did. And I, I, felt, I felt like I had stepped over a line. And so it's an imperfect science, but it's a line I try not to cross. How do you balance that, like, you know, on the one hand, you have, yeah. you have real life friendships, which are the subject for your your work, your art. And then on the other hand, you know, like I'm using those relationships for this thing that is, you know, for me. And it's it's messed up because there is a degree of you know, of egoism. And to be honest, I don't think that anybody's privacy is worth violating for a lousy song. <laughs> but that song, Layla, is really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I, I have no argument. <laughs> Point. So it's, it's tough. It's like you know, you you end up with a very um, a very difficult hanging scale to try to balance. I think. So once you've got the lyrics for the song written, um, you know, what's the next step? You got your you got a napkin from the wedding with <laughs> all of your ideas yeah. on it. Like where do you where do you go from there? Yeah. So usually I'll I'll have kind of a. Uh, like a pile of scraps on which some potential lyric fragments are written. I'll find a beat um, or, a, or a piano line, and then I'll try to match all of the fragments that seem well suited to the emotive center of a given piece of production, and then start assembling the li full lyric kind of piecemeal. So I've got this four bar that I really like, and I've got this two bar that I really like, and I've got another verse that's eight bars long, and I'll kind of Lego them all together, and then create a full demo, usually in just like GarageBand using a, um, using the pinhole mic that's on the top of the screen on a, on a MacBook. Wow. I would not have guessed that. Um, so, you know, <laughs> you've got this, <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I just, I always assume that there'd be more, you know, kind of complicated <laughs> infrastructure. <laughs> sure. I did You too. know what yeah. I mean? Because I, the reason I, I say that is because well, you're going to hear pieces of things that she's done tonight, and you're not going to think, wow, that was done through the pinhole mic on the top of a Macintosh computer. <laughs> Bear with me. Um, I guess I wanted to know, you know, do you, do you always, is that something that you, so using only the Macintosh mm -hmm. or, you know, your bar napkins, um, what do you, where do you work most? You From know? there, yeah, sure. So I'll usually just demo sitting in my living room um, on my couch, you know, and I'll be kind of leaning over my, my Macintosh singing with, with headphones on. And then when it's time to record the real song, we'll do a lot of our recording with Joe Mabbitt, who is a studio owner and engineer, really like one of the best um, here in, in Minneapolis. He works at a spot called The Hideaway, which he also operates. Um, but I do a lot of my vocals still in my closet because I'm kind of neurotic and I know he's totally game to sit through a lot of takes, but I just hate the feeling of like the the only other person in the room is really bored. You wouldn't want it to It terrifies me. Yeah, I don't want him to I don't want him to hear me like freaking out going, Can I do it again? Just just one more time, I think is the sentence that's said most by any vocalist tracking. Just one more time. Just one more time. I mean, you sound insane. You know, you sound like a junkie. I mean, it just sounds horrible. So um, so I like to do I can smell the desperation <laughs> from here. And it's not even happening right now. That's beautiful. <laughs> so I usually record all of my vocals or the lion's share in my uh, my closet, which I've which I've soundproofed with like a staple gun and blankets. 
Yeah. Mm. And we have we actually have a, a clip. We do. So of this some of your closet work. <laughs> <laughs> this is in the closet, and this is um, one of the choruses to call off your ghost, like all the vocal tracks that are stacked on one another. One of us got clumsy, and both of us got wise, and now we're not so young, seems our wishing well's gone dry. We've been living too long, too close, and I'm ready to let you go, I'm ready, so call off your ghost. <laughs> so, <laughs> right? Yeah. So just, just so I understand you, that beautiful piece of music was recorded with you standing on top of your dirty socks. <laughs> I don't have AC, and so I always wear like a really grimy pair of, um, of like sweatshorts and a sports bra. And in my closet, I have a post-it note that says, no crying, um, <laughs> for when I get super like frustrated. So that's where that was from. I just want to state at this point that publicly... We, I'm already, our, my expectations <laughs> for this event have already been exceeded. <laughs> I kind of feel like we, maybe we should even quit while we're ahead. It, it's, it's done. So there's a lot of vocal parts mm -hmm. going on there. And, you know, the, this is sort of a, a common problem, I think, with, as, as the technology increases. Like, you can put a lot of things on songs. Um, financially, it's just not reasonable to even think about touring with the personnel necessary to recreate some of the things that you do in the studio or on a record. So my question is, how do you capture the essence mm -hmm. of that and do it with just the two or three of you that sing in a band? To do it live. Yeah, to yeah. do it live. So um, you know, the, the live band with which I tour was really um, integral in the recording and the writing of this record. And Abby Wolf, uh, who, who I've had the pleasure, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of working with for a lot of years. Abby Wolf um, has been serving actually as vocal director on our release shows. So helping to listen to all those stacked harmonies and then help me figure out exactly how they can be best communicated by fewer voices. So like, Abby, can we do, uh, like I'm just making this up. Hey Abby, guess what just occurred to me? <laughs> I was thinking, um, let's, let's do the, the hook from Call Off Your Ghost like we do it live. And I'm going to just stand up so I can see. We've been living too long, too close, and I'm ready to let you go. I'm ready. So call off your ghost. <laughs> so Abby will take both the low lines sometimes, the high lines sometimes, and then do like an echo so that it feels like even though there's only two voices running at once, several parts are being uh, intimated, are being implied. Well done. You want to, uh, you're going to actually do a couple of, uh, as promised, there will be some f uh, full band performances today. I believe this is one, yeah? This is. All right. Give it a whirl. The song is still called Call Off Your Ghost. <laughs> I did. Shirts and high shoes, you cross the room, just the decent thing to do. Make sure we'd all been introduced. You brought your new friend, I brought mine, shake hands, pay courtesy, it's due. But it takes its And it takes it. Your ass 
And can't we just be friends? But this better my chest still rings And it's better to just pretend That I can't see you waving Can't hear you call my name And I know how much you hate it Babe, I gotta walk away You once said if we were careful We could do this all our life All but one of us got clumsy both of us got wise, and now we're not so young. Seems I wish it was well gone. gone. We've been living too long, too close, and I'm ready to let you go. I'm ready to call off your ghost. She lives around here I see her almost daily All I can do to stop myself From saying something crazy I don't think badly of her I hope she makes you happy It's just a lot to ask To watch your future walking past me And I know that jealousy Is a perfect waste of time But left to my devices I've spent far too long wasting Spent far too long wasting my eyes. And we've been This is Dessa Deconstructed from the local show in 89.3 The Currents. Uh, I love, uh, yeah, man, you got a great band. I know, I do. Really Don't touch them, man. They're, they're mine. I'm, I know. <laughs> first Sneak first around. rate players, man. No yeah. kidding. Um, so, are you, are you ready? Yeah, okay, this, we're going to have a little more fun. You, you guys up for some more fun today? <laughs> okay. So, the last two songs that we've talked about in today's program were produced by Doomtree member Paper Tiger. Uh, however, he's not the only member of Doomtree that makes beats, nor is he the only one on Parts of Speech. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I'd like to introduce you to Laserbeak. Let's get back here. Get into the zone. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Thanks so for having me. Beak, what do you what do you do? What is a producer? What do I do? Um, I make the beats. I make like, if I produce it, mostly all the music in the background. It's not the vocals. That's me creating. Okay. You guys right? follow that? Okay. <laughs> no, I'm confused. Oh, we'll clear it up for you. Uh, I think a lot about beat making. It, it, to me, hip hop is super cool because it's like this other version of audio creation. It's like sonic collage, you know. There's a lot of ways to do it. Originally, in the first era of hip hop, the components for making beats were borrowed or sampled from existing records. Pretty quickly, lawyers got involved. And uh, well, it was to protect the intellectual and artistic property of the musicians on those original records, or at least the songwriters. Mm -hmm. That's where you do the noise. Um, <laughs> these days, if you want to do it that way, you have to have really deep pockets and you have to pay for the use of all those samples. Where does that leave a guy like you as a producer in 2013? With not very deep pockets. <laughs> um, I wasn't going to, I'm, where I've, does that leave a guy like you? You know, um, we use a lot of, we've been fortunate enough to meet and know a lot of um, musicians in this city. We're fortunate to be in a city where there are a bunch of awesome musicians, I should say. Um, so we are now like kind of sampling our friends' 
creating parts. So, you know, the same process of, oh, that's a cool guitar line. I only want to use three of those notes. But instead of Santana playing it, it's Dustin Kyle or, you know, same with Sean on bass, things like that. So getting creative, but not abandoning the process because it's a cool thing. Like sampling is cool. Like the idea of a loop or something that, that happens over and over again in your mind like that, it sounds different than if a guitar player played those three notes for three and a half minutes. There's something special about capturing this little nugget and then looping it as far as I'm that concerned. That same feel. Yeah. In a repeated fashion. Yeah. You guys want to see how he does it? Yeah. Okay. Bring up the beat cam. Bring up the beat cam. I always wanted to hear that. <laughs> yeah? Is that working? Wait, let's see here. Is it working? Where's, where's okay. our little... Where's our, Can oh, you there see it, it light up even a little bit? <laughs> oh, this is exciting. We went all out. Okay. We went all out for you today. Yeah. I feel good. All right. I feel really good. <laughs> so uh, let's just start with the, the most obvious question. What is that thing sitting what in front of you? What is that thing? So this is called an MPC. And this is what I've always made beats on. I learned Steph, actually, when we started Doomtree, was like, hey, we always talk about rap music. You play guitar. You'd be good at making beats. And he like went out, and it was an older version of this, but he basically like showed me what to buy and taught me the basics in an afternoon. And that's all I've known ever since. This is how I make the beats on this thing. What does MPC mean? I don't know. <laughs> Next question. <laughs> MIDI, I'm sure. That's MIDI a trick question because nobody knows. Do, MIDI do production you know? center. Oh, you know? Sean knows. Is it a real thing? Oh, yeah. Is but this a not, real thing? But, no, but you're not going to say what it is? Oh. Yes. MIDI Production Center. Okay, cool. All right. And this is I called the know. Renaissance. I wasn't, I wasn't trying to embarrass you. I, just, I thought now. it was funny that none of us knew what it was. <laughs> um, all right, so we already established sounds come from your friends or yeah. from you. Right. Or drum machines or keyboards. I mean, it's like, yeah, we have, like, I have some keyboards in the basement, and I, you can get all these drum packs, all these different drum sounds from old drum machines and things like that. So you get... You have to get creative with it these days. So, so what do you got in the MIDI production so today? For this, so this is, we're going to break down Skeleton Key, which is track four on Parts of Speech. Um, and so this is a beat. I guess I'll just show you. So there's pads. I'll just break it down as simple as possible and just stop me if I'm boring you. Um, but so beats, especially hip-hop beats, there's like a lot of drums on there. So you've got your kicks. Um, and I usually use a bunch of different kicks and then play them together to make like a bigger new kick. And then same with snares. But that's the snare, you know? So it's like um, hi-hats, crashes, things like that. And then, you know, melody is very important to me in, in the process with how I do things. So for this one, it was like trying to play. I'm not the best piano player. I get by by sampling myself. So I can play a chord, sample it, assign it to a pad, and then play those pads a lot faster than I could move my fingers to the next chord, I guess. So for this, I would like played around. <laughs> it's awesome, <laughs> yeah. right? Right? So now it's just one finger instead of like, and then like eight <laughs> seconds in between fumbling for the next chord. Um, so now, so for this, it was like I'd kind of been playing around and I'd found four or five chords and it was just a matter of like, okay, now how do you put these together and get something so you can start? And so for this, it was with these four chords and it was just hitting them again. There's the second chord. So it doesn't look as cool as playing a piano, but it lights up, and that's how I get away with it. And then I like to do things in eight bars instead of four, so that's why the chord changes a second time instead of just looping four bars, because a lot of hip-hop, it'll be two or four, and that gets really repetitive. And when you go to eight, it almost tricks the mind, so when you go that far, when you go back to one, it's like, oh, this is new again. And so that's how you get away with making like a four-minute long hip-hop song. Is there, is there some science behind that, or is that just gut? Well, that's, how, that's my gut. I mean, that's how I've always felt about it. But I, want, I always want to hear another chord in there, so it's just how do you extend the chord progression, I guess. So Pull it all break. together. Yeah? Yeah, yeah do just it. Play a bunch of stuff. Okay, yeah. so there's that. There's like the... Then I was like, okay, I need a, a low chord to hold the low end down. So you can play this like a keyboard. So there was the chord. <laughs> right? But you can... so. Now I can like add on to that chord progression. So it's like, you've got the thing in there. And now you've got like a bass line almost somewhere in there. So now there's the little piano. So then it was like, all right, now we've really got something here. Let's add drums. So here's the hi-hat. It's a pretty basic hi-hat, right? So then I always like to have a second hi-hat. 
so it's kind of moving, a little movement, and then it's rap, so you just gotta have a, you know, it's gotta be on the two and four generally. Um, and I like to add a lot of percussion. So here's some toms underneath it to kind of give it more of a, a feel. Um, I get a little crazy with like bongos and shakers and stuff. So I recently purchased a lot of kids uh, percussion toys on Amazon. But so now you've got a feel and then with, with rap I feel like a lot of a lot of the feel of the beat is in the kick. So that's like tells your head what to do, it tells like your torso what to do. I don't know. That's it's usually this for me. I'm usually doing this. Um, but so you know now you've got oh there's a crash in here and a, a drum fill that you'll hear. Whatever. So, so that's like, with rap it's really cool because you can take that and if you're pulling things in and out, like even dropping hi-hats out of a beat will like greatly change the feel of the beat and will also change how the rapper raps on the beat because like without the hi-hats now they have to go off of a different instrument to be informed. Okay, so there's the core beat and then there's always a chorus in a song. You usually want to have like another melody line. Um, so I, I did the same thing with, I really love organs. And so I sampled that organ note. Turned it, nope. I sampled that organ note. I turned it into the keyboard on this thing so I could play it out. And, um, and I was just playing around with it and you just kind of create the, the melody line, so. And so that's like the core, you know, and like, it doesn't sound the greatest right here because it's out of this thing, but then we take it to Joe, we get it mixed well, we bring in Dustin who actually then like played out the chords correctly, <laughs> added a guitar line under the organ. But basically I just got to show you all the pads lighting up so you're wowed by that, but. Is that working? No, they didn't light up. <laughs> Hold on, they're gonna light up. So like here's the drums, you can see the hi-hats, the kicks, the snares. Um, and then on this side, you've got the, the keyboard and whatever, other stuff. <laughs> other stuff that lights up. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that didn't take up the whole, uh, the whole hour. Let's, let's, hear the, uh, let's hear the finished uh, clip that we got. all in there that's how it happens give it up for laser beak thank you guys and the beat cam beat cam <laughs> I, I think unknowingly you may have given us maybe the greatest gift of this year the little yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna need that tomorrow morning on my desk laser beak does a very serpentine shoulder dance Clearly, holy cow <laughs> and it's about to sweep the nation so you should probably learn it's gonna it be big so let's talk a little bit about um, one of the songs that you wrote with the whole band. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about the first one on the record. It's called The Man I Knew, and it's heavy, like thematically and, you know, sonically. Wh where did this come from? Musically, it came from um, a guitar line, actually, that Dustin and Kyle wrote. We were preparing to do a show at the Cedar Cultural Center, which was a commission gig. I think one of the only commission gigs we've ever done. But they have a program there where they ask you to do a whole show and to collaborate with people with whom you've never collaborated before. So it was the core band and I getting ready for this gig. We knew that we had to collaborate with some new folks. So we were starting to build some song structures. And in rehearsal, I heard Dustin messing around with a guitar line. And, um, and my head snapped. And I was like, hey. Like very casually, I'm like, what's that? Just wondering what that might be, which is very much like, I need, I, I want that now. <laughs> in the same way that when I heard Laserbeak play that skeleton key beak, right? Very casually, like, hey, I was just wondering, is anybody like rapping on that yet? Or, <laughs> you know, <laughs> mine. So I heard, I heard Dustin playing that line, and, um, and I really liked it. Dustin, will you, will you humor me and will you play the Man I Knew line?
so awesome. So, um, so I was like, man, we should, we should do something around that. And then I think it was Sean that was like, yeah, dude. To Dustin, not to me. Yeah, dude. That sounds like a decil line. <laughs> and in one way, it feels good, because you're, like, you're known by your bandmates. <laughs> and in the other way, it's like, what do you mean, man? Uh, no, seriously, what do you yeah, mean, man? Yeah, seriously, go ahead. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that, that it moves in a couple directions, so it goes up and down within a four-bar pattern, and it sounds similar to something like Mind Chef 2 that you did earlier. So there's like this sort of finger-picked element. There's this element of sort of minor movement, but it has up up movement and down movement, and so that seemed very uh, desa -esque Do you mean me. it sounded sad? I, well, I, no, but there's lots of different sads. It sounded, <laughs> it, it didn't sound dour. It sounds like, um, it sounds optimistically depressed. <laughs> <laughs> They know you so well. <laughs> well. I mean, you know, like, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> He's right. I don't know what to say. There's, yeah. uh, just like anything else, you have certain, you know, favorites or tendencies or colors that you prefer to paint with. Do you, I mean, what do you think about that? Uh, I know that my mom was like, like, I didn't think this record was that sad. And I think it is, though, actually, <laughs> after, <laughs> after talking to people. But my mom always is like, baby, it's so nice. You sing so nice. Why do you always write songs to bleed out to? I got one of the early versions of the record, and it actually had a sticker on the front. <laughs> like a cell, you know, like songs to bleed out to. <laughs> it's like a warning sign for yeah, parents. Right. Like, does yeah. your child own a Dessa record? Yeah. So, so I heard that, and then <laughs> heard that we were going to build a around it, you know, as a band. I thought it was a really strong line, so Sean wrote this really good, a really good pair of, like, bass lines that complemented that guitar line really well. And, um, and then for a while there, I just was, like, I knew the kind of feel that I wanted the lyrics to have, but I wasn't sure about the kind of subject matter that I wanted the tune to address. And so did the same thing that I did to Warsaw, which is just kind of mumble along. So will you do it? Will you do it again? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna. You're gonna mumble for I us. I am. I'm gonna simulate our first take of the song. And we just did that for like I don't know. We did that for like 15 minutes and and recorded it on. Um, Recorded it on an iPhone, which is how we record a lot of our stuff when we're at practice. Like everybody immediately is like, "Are we gonna take this one?" And then there's like all five of us are like, "And go." <laughs> um, just like recording on the the little microphone, you know, audio and voice memo feature, yeah, on the on the iPhone. So then took that home and recorded over it, kind of filling in all that mumbling with words that are words. Yeah, how do you, how do you get from you know the, those sounds to the the lyric, you charmed the snake, you picked a card, you bent the spoon, a curved plane, the shapes change, Euclid's made to play the fool. I had a friend who was doing some drugs and totally keeping it together. <laughs> and I was like, maybe, I don't know, maybe I really bought into the whole after school special thing <laughs> more than I should have, <laughs> to be honest. So I was sort of like reconsidering some of my kind of pure, I don't know, provincial morals, I guess, at that point. You know, somebody I'd known really well and continued to, to know was, um, was choosing, like, a really different lifestyle. But at the same time, was on operating on a pretty different plane. And I had first learned about non-Euclidean geometry, which is, like, when you have an, iso when you have a, um, an equilateral triangle. So imagine just, like, a classic triangle that, um, that has all of the sides and angles equal. <coughs> like a yield sign. Um, if you put that same triangle and you c and pretend that it's like, a let's say, a cellophane sticker or a vinyl sticker and you were to put it on a globe, you know, so you put it on your globe at home, it really changes all the angles of the triangle. So one of the few things that I remembered from like high school geometry was like all angles in a triangle always add up to 180 degrees. 
And then when I learned about non-Euclidean geometry, I learned that that wasn't actually true, that you could have a triangle whose degrees added up to much more than 180. Mm. 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 And I thought, I am reconsidering a lot of my basic axiomatic principles. You sort of cha you challenge yourself in that song. As the narrator, you talk about the person, and then you talk about yourself, like, who am I to to do this stuff, yeah. to think these things. Yeah, kind of. I mean, I, as I w I'm more attracted to binary thinking than I wish I were, you know? I'm kind, of, I'm kind of a right angled kid in a lot of ways, which means that sometimes I don't have a very nuanced worldview of, of like really complicated foreign affairs, let's say. You know, I'm really programmed to want to be like good guy, bad guy, which is a super useless way <laughs> to view like Middle Eastern politics. <laughs> It only works if you're making a Star Wars film. Yeah, yeah. Like I'd be, yeah. I'd They're be good, right? There's no gray area. But it's, it's. I think that's one of the like challenges that I will continue to work through in my adulthood is is figuring out uh, like the abundance of human phenomena that happens in between the poles. You want to perform this one for us? Badly. Right now? You're gonna do it badly. <laughs> you're gonna do it. No, uh, I want badly to do it well. Oh, really? That's great. Okay. By the time that you told me, it was already plain that you changed. But your conscience was clean and as white as a line of cocaine. My back to the wall of your bedroom apartment. You're talking in circles, got two cigarettes burning. And I couldn't hide, I was afraid I was to see you so strange. Don't get me wrong, I've got no ill will for you. It's just been so long. I thought I'd always know you, but you're so far gone. Up where the air gets thin. You cut the kite strings. I've seen my name in lights. I've seen my face in papers. My civilian life. I spent ten good years waiting, 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 waiting for you. You charm the snake. You pick the card, you bent the spoon. The curved plane, the shapes change. Euclid's made to play the fool. But I don't know what that stuff does to you. And I don't know if it's real, but I spent a decade in love with you. And I can't tell if you're here, cause me. It still prefers a legal poison. Who am I to tell you to come down? Sit back and raise a glass, a glass to easy choices. Who am I? Yeah, who am I? Who am I to tell you to come down? Kiss me in a dream. And when I woke, what kind of foolishness is this? Breathe not a lungful of your smoke. I've seen you at your brightest one of mine. Let it burn. Who am I to pull you down to earth? Who am I? Yeah, who am I? Who am I to tell you to come
This is Dessa deconstructed from the local show in 89.3 The Current. We're taking an inside look at Dessa's creative process and her new album, Parts of Speech. That was Dessa and the band performing The Man I Knew. I want to ask you um, about instruments that you might play. Do you play any <laughs> instruments? <laughs> I play a uh, Casio keyboard with the skill of a five-year-old who practices diligently twice a week. <laughs> That's a good answer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how do you catalog the ideas that you have, mm -hmm. both lyrically, I guess you can add that in there too, but also melodically? Yeah, I, I, I rely pretty heavily on that little voice memo function of my iPhone for melodic ideas. And um, and Abby and I, when we work on harmonies together, you know, I think our phones are out. I would say s ninety percent of the time to try to capture the ideas that we come up with. And then when I'm working at home, I um, I put my iPhone either kind of like on a on a little ledge right next to me while I record, or sometimes I hold it between my jaw and my sternum, recording a video of my hands because I don't read music, so that will remind me what keys I'm pressing. <laughs> we should get you some sort of headgear. <laughs> I should take a theory course. <laughs> I, feel like the current, I, I feel like the current could help out with this in some way. <laughs> this is a Kickstarter campaign, which is gonna start right after the broadcast. Um, so for the next song that I, that I think we're chatting about, It's Only Me, right? Um, mm -hmm. For that one, I it's a very simple piano line, which are the only kinds of piano lines that I can play. And I just set up my iPhone in my living under room. Under your chin? On my chin. This one I did not do under my chin. I just set it up you know, on a counter or something. And then um, played, played a little demo that I would then later send to the band and to some other musical collaborators. I think we have it. I think we might. I've been having that dream again It seems I always will I don't know what the thing means Except it sends me to the telephone And still I know that love is never The, the capture of the idea. And then I ended up um, you know, sending that to several friends to see how we could best make a, a, you know, a final like presentable arrangement. And I found the answer when I wasn't looking for it. I'd been listening to um, a Pandora station um, of Jan Tursen, who is like a, yeah, who's like a composer that does a lot. I know him mostly for movie scores, which is, I'm sure, a super cheap thing to say. But that's how, that's how I ran into his work. And Cecil Lauder is a really big fan of him in Dune Tree. So I wanted to hear more stuff like his. So I put his Pandora station on. And then I heard this really cool um, cello piece come on by a dude whose name I didn't know how to say. And I was like, this is really nice. And um, that song, I know, was called Fishin' with an apostrophe at the end. Yeah. And so, will you, will you play the little piece of that one? Sounds like a Dessa song. <laughs> uh, t I will take that as a compliment. But yeah, th that's... What do you love about that? Ah, that's so moving that I almost don't, I, I feel like slightly uncomfortable, to be frank, like listening to that in public. You know what I mean? Like so that's not the place you want to listen to that is like on a live stream. <laughs> uh, it's, I've, I, that's what is the vulnerability it? Think, that think, bothers you? Like the chin thing uh, and the socks and the tag yeah, on the yeah, pants? Yeah, yeah, yeah. None of that? Because I can talk about that and I can share humble facts, but that's like real feeling in real time, which is a very different thing. Um, I don't, there's probably an X factor to it, but I think that it's both like, it's optimistically depressive and, 
and it manages to be sad, sort of, in like some of the chordal choices, I think, and sort of that like that legato, that you know, the bowed stuff. But then there's this urgency to it, you know, where you're doing that kind of plucked sound really fast. And I like that pairing quite a bit. Um, if you were reading the DSM-4, that would be called a mixed state, where you're both <laughs> manic and depressive at the same time. That's my jam. <laughs> That's my jam. Um, so I looked that dude up on Google, and his name was Takanobu. And he's sitting in this room somewhere. Um, and I Googled him, so I found him. I thought, this dude's awesome. And then I went immediately to Twitter and Facebook because I was really hoping that he was not famous because else he wouldn't work with me. You, so did, a, you, did, a, you did a total like friend comparison? Yeah. You got, I got. How many Twitter followers do you have, man? I'm trying to get you to arrange a song. And this is a possibility? Guy. Yeah. If you're and in so the same zone? If there wasn't an extra digit in the followers on Twitter, I thought maybe he'd return an email. And um, and it, it seemed like he was in a realm of possibility, so I like clicked the contact me button on his website. <laughs> I was like, I'm a rapper from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and um, I wrote a sad song, and I'm hoping that you would take a listen. Emailed him that little iPhone demo. He listened to that in headphones while he recorded layered cello over it, and then um, he was like, Hey, you know, I mentioned this at the release show, which I played a few days ago, but he said, You know, this isn't really uh, in time. And I was like, I know. I don't know how to do that. So we're going to have to work around it. <laughs> you know, one thing at a time. You get the melody right, you yeah. get the time right. Don't you worry about the mode. time. Don't oh. worry about the time. Um, so there are, like, even in that clip we played, there's one bar of six. At the end, there's one bar of three. And the producer who I was working with, like, Jim, Jim Abbott, the engineer, was like, some really interesting metric choices. I hadn't oh, made a single metric choice that I was aware of. <laughs> <laughs> Not one. So he sent, he sent me the cello performance back, and then I recorded my vocals over what he'd done. Let's hear the finished version. But there's no sword without an edge. And I sleep uneasily when you're not in my bed. Cause Hey, Nick, will you stand up and take a bow? <laughs> We've got one more song we're going to take a look at here. And I think you would agree, I'm assuming you're going to agree with me here, that a song, you know, is never really actually totally finished. Um, I know that you've, I'm assuming you agree with me because I know you've done some revising on your own between uh, Badly Broken Code and Cash of the Twin. You kind of redid some things. Things look different live than they do on the record. So you must have at least some willingness to kind of let things be uh, a little bit more, I don't know, like clay. Move around a little bit. I, mean, I think so. I think you know you always want to find like the best presentation for a tune. But probably like when I when I purchase a record as a music listener, like that's the version to me. You know, that's the definitive version. But when you're in an ensemble like who's playing stuff every night, I mean, you've heard that song done slightly differently. You know, for years and years and years. So it's almost like there's sort of a neighborhood in which that song lives. You know, it's like when you're on your iPhone and the blue dot is sort of roaming around. It's like it that. Like the the we're somewhere around here. This is somewhere where the song exists. It might be where you think you are. It might be the neighbor's pool. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I got fooled too many times. That blue dot is not a pool. <laughs> uh, so I guess if that's the case, then when do you know 
you're ready? You know, when when does it work to the point where you feel like, all right, yeah. here we go? I think with some songs, it dials in pretty quickly. In particular, when I'm working with like Laserbeak or, or Paper Tiger beats, there are just fewer variables with question marks by them. I know generally how the beat goes. Now I've just got to write lyrics, melodies, and maybe work together to structure the thing. But um, But working with the band, you know, you start not with a great beat, but with like total silence. Um, so there's just a lot more variables to be dialed in. You know, what guitar line, what guitar sound, how long should the pre-chorus be? Should there pre be a pre-chorus? And with Annabelle, which is um, one of the last songs on the record, that I think was the one that took the longest for us to dial in. We tried it in a lot of ways, some of them very promising and some of them very stupid. You brought some I examples. Did. This is awesome. So this is this is the demo. So this was me like playing piano with one hand and then rewinding it to play piano with the other hand. So this is maybe three or four hands worth of piano. Annabelle, pick up the phone. I'm calling from the kitchen. We just never seem to listen when we're sharing the same room. Okay, beautiful done. Beautifully done, this. And so then I would send that around to everybody in the, you know, everybody on the team to see what we could come up with. And at first it was like, cool, you know, it's probably a piano tune. Let's just get like somebody who can actually play the piano to play it. And so this is what we had. And that was like beautifully rendered, but I realized that the parts that I wrote, like when you played them and you know how to play piano, sort of sound like your Macy's <laughs> playing a Christmas special or something. It just sounds, it didn't sound tight, man. So then I was like, well, maybe we should go like an all string version and um, you know, just do just do strings. And so Dustin whipped up this super quick version on Finale, a software program for strings that he called Annabelle Rigby. He's still mad we didn't use it. <laughs> that should go on the Christmas uh, record. Yeah. And then I feel I feel like our biggest lapse in judgment was the next one, which was like a, I don't know a 1960s surf rock version of Annabelle. Out there in the glory, motionless for hours. Yeah, it's just like there's a statue dressed in Annabelle's old clothes. You know? Yeah. So we did that for like, I don't know, between a dozen and two dozen more times until Dustin came to practice one day with a really pretty um, guitar line that to me sounds like it's kind of a Spanish guitar line, although I guess that's a layman's guess. So that was what we that was what we landed on. There was a lot of positive response all around the circle. Yep, that feels right. I guess I can't explain exactly why. It just felt like the timbre, you know, like the voice of the guitar matched the feeling of the song a lot better than anything we'd come up with. Have you ever played with stuff to the point where you're, you know, you never, you ne have you ever not arrived at that and just left it alone? Yeah, there was a song. I feel like there's a few songs that are not on parts of speech that might never be sung, or we might have some idea that pulls them back from the cutting room floor because we know now how to how to render them in a more successful way. Dustin and I, in particular, had worked on a, a tune that didn't quite make the cut this time, which maybe <laughs> you're looking at me like you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> a tune called Hope Relay that I think might end up somewhere in the future. Somewhere, someday. someday. Do you want to uh, perform the, the agreed upon final not surf rock version of uh, <laughs> Annabelle right now? Yeah. All right. Annabelle, pick up the phone. I'm calling from the kitchen. We just never seem to listen when we're sharing the same room. I'm not sure anymore what might get your attention. Every day you see me less than you did just the day before. Out there in the garden, motionless for hours. Yeah, it's just like there's a statue dressed in Annabelle's old clothes. 
Part of me is afraid to wake you from the dreams you're having. Scared the scattered pieces won't come back together whole. Another quiet evening. The book that you've been reading's open, but I don't believe I've seen you turn a single page. Even here, right beside you, I barely recognize you. You're like a photograph I'm watching fade away. I wanna shake you. I'd prefer that you were angry with me. You're like a bird now looking lost without a cage. And I don't know what to call it. I'm not sure who could solve this problem of a disappearing girl on Wednesday. to drag across the floor. Same scene we had last night, and I still don't know what happens to you. I just stand here useless, sometimes listen through the door. The ringing in your ears has gotten worse. It's hard to take, you say. It sounds like heavy traffic as we're climbing into bed. And I believe I almost hear it. I know better than to touch you lately. Praying I don't wake up to the car crash in your head. Annabelle. This is Dessa Deconstructed from the local show in 89.3, The Currents. Uh, we just got kind of done taking a good look at Dessa's creative process in her new album, Parts of Speech. Now, are you open to some feedback on that last one? Because I feel like there's a couple different directions that you haven't explored and that we can okay. make. Okay, well, ska, what do you... <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's time for actually the uh, Q&A part of the program. I've asked all the questions that I have, and I think that I want to know what you want to know. So if you have a question, throw your hand up in the air, and I'll come around with you, uh, to you, and you can ask Dessa and the van uh, a question. Let me, I'm just going to start with one we, we grabbed off the, uh, the internet here. All right, let's see. There we go. Alex asks, on the front cover of Parts of Speech, your hair is all over the place. <laughs> but on the back cover, your hair is perfect. What is the reasoning behind the change? I think in trying to figure out how to be like, do the visual part of my job has been one of the hardest questions for me as an artist. I don't wanna, I don't wanna be really like pretty and, and young looking all the time because I think that I can't do that for very long. You know, I will get older and a young woman's figure um, will fade. 
and I'd like to be writing songs and writing essays a lot longer than my figure will last. So to try to figure out like how to make interesting images that don't rely necessarily on be beauty, I guess, like physical beauty, um, I think will be a, a big, trying to figure it out. So I worked with a photographer who had some really cool ideas about how to make a compelling image that wasn't necessarily like a glamour shot, you know, where it's not like you look great and perfect. And I liked the idea of wearing little or no makeup and then just um, trying to create an interesting composition. So what he did is he had a friend hold a fan like four inches from my head and mess up my hair. Then he took a, the picture on the front and then I brushed it all out and faced away from the camera. And he took the image that was on the back. And it felt right because the, the record has a couple of very distinct sides. There's some real, you know, kind of produced tracks and then there's some very simple organic tracks too. And it felt like those could be well represented on that kind of duality. Thanks, Alex. You got a question? Uh, what's your name and where are you from? I'm Eric, and I'm from the Twin Cities here. What's your question? Um, as a, a student of philosophy, I'm drawn to lyrics. And a lot of your songs, at least in my interpretation, have a very philosophical basis. So I was wondering if that's true or if that's just my interpretation from the state I'm coming from. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe the answer is yes. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I generally don't write any songs with agendas. Like, I'm going to write this song to make people vote. You know, I'm going to write this song because I want to really express how feminism is relevant. Uh, only because I don't know how to do that well in song. I feel like if I want to have, like, a, a commentary piece, I, I feel comfortable doing that in an essay. But a lot of songs that, like, tell you what to do, make I don't like those as a listener. They, they, it's like, I don't turn on the radio because I'm looking for moral guidance. You know what I mean? I turn on the radio because I'm trying to have a party or I'm, or I'm driving to work or whatever. So... Um, so I think I write songs around my interests, and one of my interests is philosophy, so that probably does come through, but hopefully without a feeling of like, uh, you know, being didactic about it. Hopefully. But then I use the word didactic, so I kind of <laughs> undermine the whole thing. Yeah, okay. All right. What's your name, sir? Uh, James from St. Paul, um, now. Uh, and in fact, actually, that's kind of part of my question. I'm originally from Nashville. And uh, also lived in Atlanta for a while. There's an Atlanta sound. There's a Nashville sound, even though the Nationals and Black Keys are down there now. Um, you know, there's a Chicago sound and L.A. sound. When you're traveling around the nation and people hear that you're from Minneapolis, um, how do you describe the Minnesota sound? First of all, if you can tell me how to gain any purchase in Nashville or Atlanta, I will buy you drinks until you're dead. <laughs> until you're dead, no matter when you die. Uh, um, <laughs> Managers are here. Write it down. Um, actually, actually, Nick is, Nick is from Atlanta. Um, the cellist talking over. But I, I guess, I'm infrequently called to like just you know be a representative from Minneapolis, except for when maybe we're out doing phone phone interviews. Um, and then I still feel sort of uncertain about it. I mean, I know what I do. I know where my you know what my click does, and I know the music that's big now. But to be honest, I feel like I'm so much more credible talking as a practitioner than I am as a music scholar. Because there's so much of what happened 30 years ago here that you know, I wouldn't be, like, any, I wouldn't have any special insight on, but I do think that cross-pollination between genres seems to be an important part of what we do here. We don't have major labels. We're not waiting for, I'm not secretly hoping that any of you are from Sony, <laughs> you know? And that's real. I mean, I think that the career trajectories of people who live in different cities, sometimes you are hoping, like, maybe somebody big is here and they'll want to talk to me later and maybe we'll talk contract and we'll talk getting signed. And that hasn't been part of my like list of goals for a really long time. So I think I so I don't know. <laughs> so um, I've had I've had the opportunity for you know for the past ten years on a very slow ascent to meet a lot of people along the way here in Minneapolis who have a very different sound. You know, um, so I think that's part of it. I think we're DIY. I think we cross pollinate, and um, I think we hustle. I think a lot of it's probably also informed by like a, a punk and indie rock aesthetic, no matter what genre you're practicing in here. All right, I'm going to lean over here. All right, what's your name there? I'm Jimmy. I'm kind of hail from a lot of areas around here. But um, I have a couple questions. First of all, um, the man I knew. Are we allowed to get a little personal here? Just a little I'm bit? I'm not going to tell you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I believe it's in Spiral Brown, the, Le Levi uh, the Leviathan. Yeah. Is, is that based off of that? Is that the character? Ooh. Um, the Leviathan, 
is a, like an essay that was in a short collection that I put out a few years ago. I had been traveling and I met a dude whose name was Life. Life was a nurse and he had been asked to save the life of a street kid whose name was Angel. And this story happened to go down in La Paz, which is Spanish for the peace, which seemed like this guy had accidentally lived an allegory for his whole stupid <laughs> life. So I followed him around for four days and interviewed him and then wrote that essay. Um, I had never realized the similarities between those two pieces until right now. Yeah, I, I hang out with dudes who do drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and the second, um, if you don't mind, could you expi explain Fighting Fish just a little bit? I've, I've been really curious about that since I got the record. Yeah, I, I won't name names, but I was hanging out with a few artists who I very much admired, who we, we were asked to talk a little bit about what it was like to you know, be an artist and try to make a living in a very tough economic environment as artists. And one of them just kept saying, man, you know, you're not, it, it's not rocket science. And he kept saying, you know, you're no, um, you know, none of us up here are Da Vinci, and none of us up here are Bach, and none of us up here. And he kept saying that, and I kept thinking, don't you in your heart sort of hope that you might be, though? <laughs> I, nothing's guaranteed, you know, but I, I guess I secretly harbor some pretty big ambitions. And that means that I have to accept a very high likelihood of failure, and I accept that. But I'm, I'm not really interested in saying you know, none of us are going to be meaningful contributors. I want to try to be a meaningful contributor. And then I have to make sure that if I'm not, I can still go on and be functional and not be crazy, you know, that that failure isn't going to kill me. But uh, yeah, but so I, I guess I have some unlikely ambitions and I'm, I'm going to, I'm not going to be embarrassed. I guess I'm going to be embarrassed, but I'm not going to deny those. I'm not going to put those aside. And I feel like sometimes maybe in the Midwest we get a little... You know, don't stand out too much, and um, and everybody's special, and everybody does warrant respect. This isn't about exceptionalism, but I I'd like to I'd like to try to be something big, and I hope a lot of other people try to be something really big too. So. You got a question, sir? Yeah, um, Michael from Minneapolis. Um, the new album is awesome. I love it. Um, but my question is, what is next for Doomtree? The hip hop mecca of Minneapolis. <laughs> Good question. <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would say that seven minutes before this program started, Laserbeak and I were in a little tiny room with our two partners in business trying to decide what on earth is next for Doomtree, the mecca of hip hop Minneapolis. I think we've always sort of run it by the seat of our pants. Like, when we make good art, we push it hard. And so I think we've got some exciting good art in the works. But we try not to set too many like release schedules before the stuff is done. Because what if it's not good in time? I don't want to be in a position like a lot of artists are in the majors where it's like, well, it has to come out in September. But it could be better if I waited for six months and figured my game out here. You know what I mean? That said, we've got a killer blowout coming up. We've got some new stuff there. Um, Laserbeak's working on some pretty super secret <laughs> stuff uh, for merch for that and some, some can I say that, retrospective collections even of the past 10 years of us hustling together. It's been a decade now. Yep. <laughs> and um, Sims is hard at work at a new album. Uh, all the guys are writing at the moment. And, um, and I think we we'll e might even have some new print matter from Paper Tiger in the near future. So. S some things on the horizon. You might care to comment that uh, right now? We're working hard. <laughs> Good work. Uh, what's your name? I'm Emily, and I'm formerly from Minneapolis, but now I live in Boulder. And my question was, how does your storytelling and your songwriting intersect? And Because I, I have Spiral Bound. It's come with me across the country. Um, but how, how, do you, how does how you write stories and essays and poems differ from how you write songs? I think at first they were super different. I was a pretty lousy rapper for a good while, I think, before Doomtree asked me in. And I was hanging out with, with Steph, with POS, and I played him some of the stuff, and he said, you know, why don't you just write rap songs the way that you write essays? And for whatever reason, that was like a revolutionary question for me. <laughs> why don't I do that? Because I had sounded like a very fourth-rate version of Ladybug. Like I was <laughs> rapping about like, let's go to the club, and I don't know what I was rapping, <laughs> things that I don't live, you know, things that were not my lived experience. That helped a lot, so I felt like they drew closer. Now, when I have an idea, usually it's almost like instead of sitting down to write an essay or sitting down to write a song, 
I'll have an idea, and then I've got to quickly, as it's kind of hurtling towards me, classify it. So is this an idea that's most likely to be successful as an essay? If it's something that has a lot of subplot or a lot of, if it, a lot of ink is going to be necessary to fully express it, you know, if I'm going to need 1,500 words, that would be a really boring rap song because it would be like you know 19 minutes long. So this one's <laughs> probably an essay. And if it's only a little idea that's imagistic and doesn't have a lot of support to it, maybe that's a poem because then I can scale it appropriately. So for me, it's usually figuring out how big is this idea. And then that helps me figure out which box it's going to go into. Uh, we're at we got to we got to cut it off. We're all done. <laughs> we're all out of time. I'm sorry. Let's see if we we'll see if we can get your question after, or answered after. We I'll get hang out. So yeah, if you'd okay, like so to ask any person, I do. Uh, that concludes our program here today. Dessa deconstructed. I want to thank all you guys for coming down to this thing that you had no idea what it was going to be when you came in here. Did you enjoy, did you enjoy yourselves? I want to make sure and thank some of the members of the team here that helped all this go uh, smoothly as it did. Uh, the engineering team, Michael DeMarc and Eric Stromstead, Mari Jensen and Sam Flock. And also the video team, Nate Ryan and Jennifer Simonson and also Alex Horner. Uh, the events and programming, uh, Jeff Kamen and Justin Levy and Tony Bull. And also our PD of the current, Mr. Jim McGuinn, who like, I don't know, it just came out of his head one day that we should do this, and then we did it, and here we are. And I also want to uh, thank this guy who's been sing singling wildly at me, John Schober, the producer of the local show, who's um, really kind of been a force. And of course, I want to thank uh, the band and Dessa for coming down here today. A round of applause. Hey, thanks, David Campbell. That was awesome. Thank you. I had, a I had a lot of fun. We'll do it again. So that's uh, everything for today. And uh, but I appreciate you all being here. And if you want to just hang out for a second, we're gonna see what do we got. We got any? Uh, we got any posts? <laughs> all right. Should I, why don't we answer her question while we're while we're then we'll okay. You guys cool to hang for just a second while we recut a couple of things? No way, I'm out of here. This is bogus. <laughs> Hi, I'm Malia from Seattle, Washington. And um, I'm sorry to call you out on this, but you wrote the song. Um, so I want, to s I want to ask you a bit about Dear Maria. Um, as a female and as a listener, I want to commend you for your honesty on that one. Um, it really allowed me to relate with you even more, because I think a lot of people have been on both ends of that. But would you tell us more about that song? My best friend when I was little was named Maria. And Marie sang better than Maria, so I changed her name. And I was an extrovert, and she was an introvert. And I thought we had like a really <laughs> well balanced friendship for like 13 years. And we were very, very like one of the closest human relationships I've had. Um, when we were little, we learned fingerspelling so that after my parents said that we couldn't talk anymore and they would turn the lights out, we would continue to fingerspell into each other's hands until we fell asleep. A really close friend. And um, and I found out when she moved back to the country that she was from, after having lived in the U.S. for like those ten or thirteen years of our friendship, that although our relationship meant a lot to her, she um, she'd had like a really different run than I had, and that my extroversion, which I had imagined like made me the liaison for the two of us, like she doesn't talk a lot, so I'm gonna talk, and I'm gonna you know I'm gonna. I'm going to be the one who orders stuff, and I'm going to be the one who talks to teachers, that she felt very much like she'd been living in my shadow for those 10 years. And that was a really big like, re-education to me on how you can hurt people when you don't mean to be mean. Um, so I wrote that. Oh, this is a nice ending point. <laughs> <laughs> this is music to bleed out to, you know what I mean? Part for the <laughs> course. <laughs> All right, we only have we only have one thing. To, I don't know which what I'm doing here. <laughs> this is new territory for me too. Uh, let's see here. I'm gonna say I'm, I'm gonna say I know, right? I'm gonna say uh, you gotta talk to one of them, right? Yeah, I'm oh. gonna say something to you, and then all you gotta do is say yeah. Well, what is it though? Is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm from Sony Music. <laughs> I want your blood and your soul. Um, 
totally kidding. Um, <laughs> all right, it's, it's just a brief setup. Okay. Are we ready? It's Dessa Deconstructed on the local show from 89.3 The Current. Should we move on to the Q&A portion of the show? Yeah. Apparently, uh, we delivered the goods the rest of the time. Thank you guys again for coming. Hang out. We're going to, uh, there's food and some cocktails and a little reception afterwards. So once again, I really appreciate you guys being here. This was a ton of fun. Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> In two weeks on the local show, we'll tell you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, guys.